Uh, okay, uh, to, for Sensible BC, uh, Mr. Air Larson. Well, thank you very much. I'll, I'll take my full 10 minutes. Uh, uh, thanks for having me at this committee. I've been a cannabis activist uh, for all of my adult life. I, I run a cannabis dispensary, and I probably sold more cannabis than all the other witnesses combined. And um, it's, it's good to be here today, but I have to say that I have my doubts that this committee will actually act upon the evidence that is being brought before them in the testimony they're hearing. And I say that because I've been at this a long time, and when I first got started as a cannabis activist in the 1990s, the government was introducing the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act to replace the Narcotic Control Act. And at that time, there was a great deal of testimony and hearings, and about two dozen groups came forward, and all of them said that prohibition was a failure, the war on drugs was a failure, we should legalize and prohibition approach things differently. The only group that supported that legislation was the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police and the Canadian Pharmaceutical Association. Everyone else was against it. The government said we're going to pass this law and then we'll have a drug policy review afterwards. Well, that review never happened. Canada's Senate took it upon themselves and they issued a comprehensive and detailed report on cannabis, that five-volume report that remains probably one of the best analysis of cannabis and cannabis policy today in 2002. That report was also completely ignored, and I would in fact encourage committee members to take a look at that Senate report from 2002 because it is an incredible document. And they recommended legalization of cannabis for all Canadians over the age of 16. These were conservative senators, not, not a bunch of uh, pot smokers, and they recommended legalization for everyone over age, the age of 16. That was ignored. The year I was born, 1971, the Ladane Commission recommended decriminalizing cannabis possession and cultivation and working towards legalization, and that was also ignored. So for all of my life, I've seen our government listen to testimony, issue, do, do research, have studies, talk to people, and then ignore the results. And I hope that doesn't happen here today. The Cannabis Act is a bad piece of legislation. It is flawed in a great many ways. It doesn't even decriminalize the joint that I have in my pocket now that I'm going to smoke after this committee hearing. The idea that we're going to have licit and illicit cannabis and that we're going to have the police trying to decide which cannabis is good and which cannabis is not good is simply not going to work. In cities like Vancouver, where this already effectively decriminalized, we're not going to see much of a change in policy. But in, in northern areas where or First Nations communities or the poor people that are demonized and affected most by cannabis prohibition. You can bet police will be going after them. Where'd you get that cannabis from? That, that's illicit cannabis. We're going to charge you with possession. It is absurd at a time when we're talking about decriminalizing all drugs that we're still not even decriminalizing cannabis possession under this legislation. Now, I was asked to speak today about edibles, but to me, that's a category that, that's really too restrictive. We should be also discussing hashish, tinctures, capsules, extracts, creams, drops, suppositories, all the many ways that you can use cannabis. At my dispensary, we sell buds and we sell all these other products, and the buds that we sell is less than half of everything that we sell. So when I hear in Ontario, they're saying they're going to set up these legal shops right next to the dispensaries to put them out of business, I think, great, it's not going to affect my clients at all. 95% of my customers will continue to shop with me, even if there's a legal shop next door. It's simply not going to have the range of products that are really available and necessary. So as an activist who wants to see better drug laws in Canada, I don't like this at all. But as a business owner, it's great. This is going to keep me and other dispensaries in business for many, many years to come. This will do nothing to shut down dispensaries or affect the black market at all. And, you know, we had a pretty major court case, the Owen Smith case. Uh, Kirk Tusa, who spoke yesterday, was the lead lawyer on that case. And the courts ruled that medical patients have a right to access not only smokable buds, but cannabis and all these other forms as extracts. Health Canada's response was to allow licensed producers to make cannabis extracts with no more than 3% THC, which is a complete uh, disregard of both the, the letter and the spirit of that court decision. But it's not surprising, because that's been the attitude of the government and Health Canada for years. Every time we get a court ruling against to expand the, the cannabis access, the government and Health Canada takes the most restrictive possible interpretation of that decision. And the result of this is that the government has lost control over cannabis, and they've lost control for many years now. We've been systematically dismantling Canada's cannabis laws for the last 20 years, beginning with the laws against bongs and vaporizers and pipes, which are still on the books under Section 462.2. That law has never been removed, and yet it'd be hard to find a city that doesn't have multiple bong shops in it today. And we did that in the 1990s by simply defying the law, opening up bong shops. There was raids and conflict, kind of like now with dispensaries, but after time, police 
police and communities realized that the war on bongs was a failure, that nobody wanted to see it happen, and they gave up. And as a result, we've effectively legalized bongs and pipes, seed banks, vapor lounges, and we're on the way to doing it with dispensaries and well, and in many cities we already have. So we're not going to follow these laws, and you're creating laws that are simply unenforceable and cannot be, be you're giving the police an impossible task to do with large aspects of this legislation. I'm currently facing charges for giving away cannabis seeds. I've given away over 7 million viable cannabis seeds over the last two years. I traveled to 22 cities across Canada the last two years giving away seeds. And it was charged in Calgary in 2016 for giving away cannabis seeds. They've set aside a three-day trial for me at the end of October. Three days in court in our justice system that is letting alleged murderers and rapists go because they don't have space in our courts, but they're going to make three days for me for a trial for giving away low THC cannabis seeds to those who want them. I believe those charges will be dropped before they go to trial because what a waste of time that would be. But the fact is our courts cannot handle this massive civil disobedience campaign that Canadians have been launching and it's simply, simply not going to succeed. And I would like to remind the committee that the origins of Canada's cannabis prohibition on our drug war is not some well-intentioned effort to protect public health or to protect children or any of that. Our war on drugs, the war on opium, and the war on cannabis began as a racist and ignorant effort to eliminate Chinese people and other uh, racial communities from Canada. That's how it started. There's no question about that. And there's no time since 1908 when the Opium Act was passed or when cannabis prohibition came in the 20s and today when these laws changed from being racist and ignorant and bigoted to being somehow well-intentioned and good for our communities. These laws are bad in their origins and they continue to be terrible today. The fact is that the war on drugs is really a war on plants. And cannabis may just be the world's greatest plant. There's no other plant that has the nutritional, industrial, social, and medicinal value that cannabis does. But the other, the other aspects of this war on drugs and the war on plants are the fact that coca leaf, opium poppy, psilocyte mushroom, peyote cactus, these are all also good plants with thousands of years of social and, and cultural use. And the war on drugs is really a war against these plants and against nature, and it's time that it comes to an end. You want to know who to blame for the fentanyl crisis that we're experiencing across Canada? It's you. It's our parliament that has passed these laws that prohibits reasonable access to opiates. The fentanyl crisis is entirely the fault of Canadian policy. We don't have a drug problem in Canada. We have a prohibition problem in Canada. And when we end prohibition, we will see the vast majority of the problems we associate with drug use go away. Cannabis, in fact, is not a problem. Cannabis is part of the solution. In Vancouver, we now have two sites that are offering free or discounted cannabis medicines to opiate users as a substitution project. And there's evidence out of the U.S. showing that American states that have access to dispensaries have less opiate use and less opiate overdose deaths than those who do not. So I believe, from my personal experience and from the research, that cannabis dispensaries are saving lives every day in Canada. I know that my dispensary, people tell me, you help me get off opiates, you help me improve my health. You help save my life. This happens all the time. With alcohol also, a lot of cannabis people find when they're using alcohol, al alcohol, they can get off alcohol by using cannabis. Cannabis is a substitution for more dangerous drugs in so many ways. It's easy to regulate edibles and extracts, give them childproof packaging, make sure that the products are uh, properly labeled and the dosages are correct. That's easy to do. It's not complicated at all. And further, CBD should really be descheduled entirely and removed from the CDSA. CBD is highly beneficial. There's no psychoactivity at all. It's an incredibly safe medicine. And there's no question that CBD should be removed from the CDSA and allowed entirely. But uh, the fact is, we can buy enough alcohol, tobacco, or even aspirin. Without aspirin, you can buy without any age limit at a corner store, and one bottle of aspirin can kill you. So the idea that we're treating cannabis so severely and so restrictedly when other more dangerous substances are allowed makes no sense at all, and it really shows the, the, the failure of this legislation. So I would urge this committee to go beyond cannabis, to accept that cannabis is a good plant and that prohibition is wrong, to stop handing over this industry to the black market as you've been doing for so many decades, and to recognize that it's not just cannabis, that the whole war on drugs is an absolute failure, and it's time to legalize and regulate and put policies in place that are based on the science. We've had this research for 40 years or more now. We know that the war on drugs is a failure. We know that cannabis is essentially harmless and certainly less harmful than the alcohol or tobacco that is used uh, every day. So that's what I have to say. Thanks for having me here, and I hope that uh, this committee will listen to the evidence presented and make some serious changes to this legislation. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much. You appreciate your enthusiasm. <laughs> but 